Good morning. Welcome to an online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today, we are going to hear about the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, a landmark study from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and how you can get involved and help to advance Parkinson's research. I am Angela Neff, and I serve on PCLA's Board of Directors. For those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit that supports families living with Parkinson's disease through free events like this, support groups, and more. Today's Let's Talk Parkinson's program is brought to you by our generous Let's Talk Parkinson's sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, and Kiowa Kieran, and by donations from the Parkinson's community. If you appreciate what we do, please make a donation on our website at www.pcla.org. Thank you. Just a few quick notes before we get started. We are recording today's event for YouTube. You will only be visible in the recording if you are speaking. Please stay muted to keep the background noise at a minimum. And after the presentation, there will be time for questions. You can submit them through the chat. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Dr. Emily Tamandonfar is a clinical instructor of neurology at Keck School of Medicine of USC, which is one of 50 worldwide clinical sites for the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. Dr. Tamandonfar, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Angela, for that introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining so early um, this morning. Um, and it, hopefully the sun is coming out in, in Los Angeles today. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking about um, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, or PPMI, as I'll, I'll say for short. Um, and this is a really exciting study. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of get into it. So just before we get into the nuts and bolts of the study, I want to just provide some context. One of the, the main goals of this study is to um, identify validated biomarkers. And, and what are biomarkers? Why are they important? So biomarkers are objective measures of a condition or a disease state. So a common example that, that you may hear about is when we want to diagnose something like diabetes, um, we have a blood test that we can do. We can look at the blood sugar, and if something falls within a certain range, we can say you have diabetes. Um, and we don't have something yet for Parkinson's disease. So um, trying to understand and identify those biomarkers is really key and has implications for potentially diagnosing Parkinson's disease um, earlier on and also understanding the progression of the disease. So understanding how um, different subgroups might progress. And this has further implications also for uh, design of clinical trials. Um, so understanding how we can um, develop protocols better to better evaluate how new therapies are impacting the disease and being able to, to measure that better. So, the PPMI study um, was launched in, in 2010 and has been sponsored by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, so this study is an observational longitudinal study. So it means that we want to follow patients over time um, to really understand how the disease starts and how it progresses. Um, so we're collecting data and, and biosamples from people um, over several years. And so when we talk about, um, you know, having people involved in the study, we really ask that you consider participating for at least five years. And it's really because we are trying to understand the progression. And the study has really expanded over recent years. Um, in 2021, they launched some online platforms as well. And as you can see, um, some, uh, large enrollment goals. And the reason why um, you know, this is important, we're trying to, again, look at large um, groups of people to, to identify these, these biomarkers and understand how um, 
certain risk factors may turn into to Parkinson's disease. And one thing that I'd really like to highlight with this study, which I think is something very unique and important to the core mission of the study, is that this data that's collected, um, and I'll go into a little bit more about what sort of data is being collected, is all de-identified and it's open access. So that means that researchers across the world um, potentially can have access to this data and um, develop trials or answer questions using the data that the study is collecting. And, um, you know, if you look at the, the publications that can have already come out of this data set, we already have years worth of data um, that has been used. Um, you can see the range of research and questions that are being asked from this data set, um, from things like developing tools for strat stratifying risk factors for impulse control disorders, which we see in Parkinson's disease and related to medications that we use. So these sorts of tools um, have come out of this data set. We also see um, you know, publications related to some of the imaging modalities that we collect and um, how we're kind of quantifying um, some of these scans and understanding how these scans may predict risk factors. So quite a range of research that even to date has come out of this data set. So as I mentioned, there's, there are quite a number of platforms. It's really expanded um, the study. Um, and really, we're trying to gather as much data to understand what's important and what sort of factors are contributing to the progression of the disease. So we have the traditional clinical sites, so where you come into the, the medical office and we do clinical assessments. Um, and those clinical assessments um, include things like cognitive testing, um, neurologic examination. Um, we do biospecimen collection, which means you know, we're taking samples um, from things like blood, serum, uh, urine, we do skin biopsies as well, um, and lumbar punctures. And then also um, imaging scans, so MRIs and DAT scans as well. So all of that is part of the data that's collected from the clinical sites for certain um, volunteers and participants in the study um, who qualify. And then we have these other um, platforms as well. So monitoring through smartphone apps, um, remote screening. So um, I'll have um, some of the information on later slides, but going online, doing, um, filling out some questionnaires and seeing if you qualify for things like a smell test, which we can send to you and send back. Um, and then a lot of the patient reported data through, through an online platform. So this is really wonderful because we can really um, develop a, a large data set and then just a library of information. So um, this schematic really highlights um, some of the things I've mentioned before and, and what we're trying to accomplish with PPMI, which is understanding how the disease starts and what are the risk factors progression uh, for progression. Um, and as um, we're, aware, you know, this disease is quite complex. It's, it's not so simple. Somebody with Parkinson's disease doesn't have the same um, challenges as, as another person with Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of heterogeneity to the disease. And so as you can see in the schematic, um, people with Parkinson's disease may progress in different ways. And there's also this sort of lag time between symptom onset and diagnosis. And um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the goals with identifying biomarkers or biomarker signatures, so a constellation of biomarkers, um, is earlier diagnosis. Um, and one of the ways in which this, this study has expanded is looking at this prodromal um, subset. So people, if you look at the left of the schematic, people who have um, risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease. So genetic risk factors like LARC2 or GBA, um, but who do not have Parkinson's disease or symptoms. So we're looking at that group of people. And then um, also people with uh, REM sleep behavior. So acting out of dreams or hyposmia, which is loss of sense of smell. So looking at 
this group and seeing why does one person with loss of sense of smell develop Parkinson's disease and another with the same uh, symptom doesn't develop um, Parkinson's disease. So this is a really big question that we're trying to answer. What makes you at risk and how can we better counsel patients and understand who progresses and in what way they progress? So this, um, you know, there have been 1,400 volunteers that have joined um, in, in just the first 10 years. And you can see this grouping of, um, of patients here that we've collected um, data on. And we're really looking to expand um, these cohorts. Um, patients who have been recently diagnosed um, uh, and who are not on medication. Um, also, people who have um, uh, Parkinson's disease with a genetic mutation and those who are carriers but do not have symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And then um, also healthy control volunteers. So people who have uh, no family history of Parkinson's disease. Um, we are also looking to expand that cohort. And particularly, as Maddie just um, also updated me, so, you know, we generally we've wanted to recruit more men, male healthy controls than women. And, and part of that is um, we've recruited both, but part of that has been because men um, have a, a higher risk of, of Parkinson's disease. And so we're trying to really understand why that is as well. So these are some of the recruitment goals for each of the groups. Um, and as you can see, um, quite ambitious that those patients um, who, this is kind of the prodromal subset, um, those who are 60 years and older, who um, have REM sleep behaviors or loss of sense of smell, um, those who are carriers of genetic um, variants, um, that um, subgroup, we really um, are, are trying to recruit, participate, um, and, and understand, again, how, why do people progress to Parkinson's disease who have these risk factors? And then those who are newly diagnosed within the past two years and are not on treatment, um, that is really a, a, a group which um, would be helpful to understand to really track the natural history of the disease and understand how they're progressing. Um, and one of the questions that, that I think is also important and that if we get asked a lot is, say somebody is, is diagnosed, they're not on medication. Um, this is a, a, a trial in which you participate in for several years. So can I start medications for my Parkinson's disease if the symptoms become bothersome? And the answer is yes. Um, and we can get in a little bit more of the, the details, but generally um, we ask that you, you wait at least six months after enrolling to, to start medications. And then as I mentioned, healthy controls um, really um, is important and, and also understanding how people do who are, who are healthy and, and don't have any family history or connection to Parkinson's disease. And we have patients who have um, participated for, for more than five years. They stay on and they're the original um, participants of the study and, and we continue to learn from them and are really appreciative of their time. So this is really a global effort. So there, there are sites um, in North America, but also in Europe and a site in Africa. So we have participants from around the world and are recruiting. Um, I want to just, again, highlight the online platform. I think it's one thing that's wonderful about this study is if you're 18 years and older, um, you, you can help and participate. Um, and so really spreading the word on this online platform is important. A lot of people are sharing their data through this platform. Um, and it's as simple as going on and, and answering some questionnaires and then also there's any question about, um, you know, whether you qualify for, for further coming in for the clinic site visits, those sorts of things. The online platform has been really helpful um, in that sense. So this is, again, just um, emphasizing um, for those people who are, are newly diagnosed within the past two years, um, I really, uh, if you're interested, encourage you to, to connect with us um, here at CAC. Um, and we can uh, 
go through even more of the detailed um, informed consent, what the process um, includes um, and how frequent the visits are, those sorts of things, what sort of time commitment. Um, and those who are 60 years and older, um, you can go um, and do to this website, mysmelltest.org and um, take a smell test as well um, and see if you qualify even for the prochromal um, subset. But anyone who's 18 years and older can certainly um, gather more information and, and provide some information through questionnaires. So with this last slide, again, I, I, I want to just emphasize um, what the, the main goal has been for this study, which I think the reason why we consider this a study which can really change the landscape for our field and really advance um, what we know um, so there are the scientific components of it, right? So the, you know, the markers that we're, we're collecting and understanding how biomarkers can help us better understand the different um, types and, and subgroup um, patients with Parkinson's disease, which has implications for, you know, how we're designing clinical trials and how we counsel patients about, you know, once you have this diagnosis, what does the future look like? And it serves as really a resource for researchers. And, you know, one thing about this open access is we are able to answer more questions and also, you know, speed the time to um, getting this into the clinic. Um, so, in other words, um, having a bit more efficiency. I mean, we want to um, develop new therapies and, and help our patients as soon as we can. So um, really speeding along the process. And this trial has, has meant to be really a collaboration among pharmaceutical companies, biotech, all to kind of develop new therapies. Um, this is a, a very quick run through, but I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions as well um, and, and have my information there. Just to review, okay. just for me, for review, um, yeah. there's two different kinds of, there's two different studies going on. There's one where people actually go in and have live tests and diagnose, diagnostics, and then there's people like me who just do the online PPMI. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so one thing that's, I think, really wonderful is you can get involved in different ways. So um, for patients who, or people who qualify, um, especially those who are newly diagnosed within the past two years, not on treatment, those um, uh, participants, we, we really want them to come into the clinic. Um, we're collecting a lot of different samples, doing a lot of different examinations, cognitive evaluations, other sorts of assessments. Um, and we're trying to collect data to, to really understand how the disease progresses. Um, and then those people who are what I call the prodromal, so this group um, here, um, also to come in because we're trying to understand how they progress. And so also collecting a lot of that, those scientific types of data as well. But then, um, you know, there are other ways to kind of get involved through the online platform and really um, patient reported outcomes. So um, as you know, Angela, just kind of doing some of the assessments, providing some information about day-to-day -day challenges and um, how you're doing to sort of track again, how things progress. So yes, there's lots of different ways to get involved. And then just to review, um, is there any gender specific needs between the two as well as um, whether the people have Parkinson's or not? I know this is, you just told us this, but just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, so um, we have been, specifically for the healthy control, we have been recruiting both um, men and women for the healthy control, um, but we've sort of, we have, um, have met our sort of uh, goal for for women. So we're really looking for male healthy controls. And um, the reason is, you know, we know that men are at higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So we're trying to also understand that part of the, the puzzle. Thank you. 
Okay, we have a few questions in here. Uh, one is, what are the prodrome conditions? I'm not sure if I said that word correctly. Yes, yes. So prodrome is this group here. So um, we're really separating out to these groups, right? So the prodromal, and actually let me go back to this slide here because I think this kind of shows. So uh, prodrome is essentially those symptoms which predate motor symptoms, so stiffness, the slowness. Um, we're looking to see at what kind of risk factors, how we, do, how we are able to better determine somebody, for example, who has loss of sense of smell. Um, there are a variety of reasons why somebody may have loss of smell, and a lot of people have loss of sense of smell, um, but not everybody develops Parkinson's disease. Right. So that group, but we know that loss of sense of smell can arise many years prior to having Parkinson's disease, right? So um, patients can have 10, 20 years of loss of sense of smell before they develop Parkinson's disease. So we really want to follow those patients and understand that. The same thing with REM sleep behaviors, the acting out of dreams. Um, we know that a, a you know, 50% of patients um, with Parkinson's disease have these sorts of REM sleep behaviors, and that can also uh, be present prior to ever developing the motor symptoms. And so we're trying to target those patients. So those are the categories that we're looking at, at now. I mean, we know there are other uh, uh, kind of pre-motor um, symptoms or non-motor symptoms, things like constipation as well. But the groups that we're looking for in this study are those who have loss of sense of smell, those who have REM sleep behaviors, and those who have certain genetic variants. Um, and, uh, and, and that's who we're kind of re recruiting as of now. Thank you. Uh, here's another question uh, from Stephen. There is a group over, over 65 with diagnosis in the last decade. Where do they fit in your research? Yes, so we're, we're focusing on those who are newly diagnosed because we're really trying to understand how it evolves. So, um, you know, we, we are focusing more on those who are newly diagnosed at this point in time. We have patients and participants who have been in the study, you know, for 10 years, and um, certainly they're advancing. But as of now, that's the group that we're looking for, the newly diagnosed. So, they sh so one place these people could go is do what I'm doing, which is the PPMI online, online study. That's where, where they would fit into the research. Yeah, yeah, but exactly, yeah. So, um, are people with a first relative, i.e. parent with PD, able to participate? Yeah, so um, again, I would urge you to um, go to the online platform, if, um, but not necessarily for the healthy control that we, you know, we collect other biosamples on. So the healthy control, we want people who do not have first degree relatives, so parents, siblings, children. Um, we want people who, who have no real connection to Parkinson's disease. But you can certainly um, get involved through the online platform, um, mm -hmm. filling out the questionnaire. Very interesting, okay. I'm glad mm -hmm. that question was asked. Uh, Deborah had, um, had a question about um, demographics and encouraging other people besides non-white, I suppose, <laughs> um, people to, to participate. And she, uh, Maddie um, responded that you're making great strides in recruiting from underrepresented groups. Is there anything you'd like to mention to us about people or groups of people that you um, would really like to have, have help getting out, outreach to? Yes, I'm so happy this was brought up because we are really wanting to recruit from a, from a diverse population. I mean, um, because that is, you know, that is who we're trying to understand. It, it's really limiting if we are excluding groups of people or not reaching out to them and they're not involved. So um, certainly, I, I think, you know, one of the wonderful things about Los Angeles is we have such diversity here. 
Um, and one of the reasons why we have such all these global sites is because we want to um, we want to have that diversity in the study. So um, yes, I would you know reach out, tell everyone you know, um, because we would really like to capture that diversity. And we're making a lot of strides, doing a lot of um, community outreach as well, just locally um, to kind of help with that. So I think the more that people kind of understand the study and, and how we're using the data, I think it, it makes it much more accessible. Uh, I think this has been answered, but my grandfather was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Am I eligible as being a genetic risk at, gen at genetic risk? Yes. So for the genetic risk component, um, I think this is, this is a really good question about, um, because so I will start by saying, you know, we would want some genetic testing done to know whether or not you have the variant or mutation. Um, and so especially those who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, um, I believe, um, and Maddie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we offer genetic testing um, for that group of people. Um, so. Um, we are looking specifically if you have the, the variant. Um, so not, you're not necessarily considered genetic risk just if you have a family member. We need to identify that you have the variant. Does your research include patients with multiple diseases? So maybe Parkinson's and something else? Yes. So um, we would have to go through what I would really encourage you um, if you have um, other medical conditions, which so often we do as we age, we have um, you know more things that come with that. Um, I would encourage you to reach out, and we can kind of go through your medical history with you and see if there's anything specifically that would exclude you from participation in the study. Um, I, I think that just to kind of um, go off of this question as well, because this is something that comes up and I think is, is a really good um, point we were talking about a little bit earlier, Angela, um, is if you participate in this study, does that mean you cannot participate in other studies? I think that's something that comes up quite a bit because this is an observational study. So we are not doing any sort of intervention. We're not giving you any treatment necessarily. We're just tracking how things change over time. And so, um, especially for people who are newly diagnosed, um, there are lots of different clinical trials coming out now looking at medications which potentially modify the course of the disease. And so you may qualify for something like that. Can you participate? Um, and um, participating in this study does not necessarily mean that you cannot participate in other studies. And it, it, you would have to kind of discuss that as well with your coordinator but it doesn't necessarily mean if you're doing this study, you can't do another study. Great. This is a little bit off topic, but interesting. Deborah Hochman, I hope I said her last name right, um, donated her um, person with Parkinson's brain to research post-mortem, and she's still awaiting results. Um, and she's uh, I, I'm connecting with you. So would you like it if other people who have a relative who passes or a friend with Parkinson's who passes away, who is willing to donate their brain for research to contact you? Is that something we should let our uh, listeners know? Uh, yes, you can contact us and we can kind of direct you. There are other programs, not necessarily with this study, um, but certainly other um, efforts out there doing some work. So um, I would encourage you to disconnect with us. Yes, there is a um, pathology core in PPMI, and a lot of people have donated their brains to be studied. Um, and currently, because there isn't a lot of options for testing for Parkinson's or um, imaging for Parkinson's, a lot of the findings that have come out of Parkinson's research are um, with those postmortem donations. So it's definitely very important. And yeah, Emily can link you with the, the folks that are in charge of that. Uh, I'd like to give the opportunity for spoken questions for anyone who isn't able to type. Can you, you can unmute, just say your first name and ask your question. 
Um, I, I wrote it out. I said, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I never hear about studies for those of us whose disease is progressing, sometimes very dramatically. And uh, is anything being done for people like that? Where do you go for help with that? Yeah, so I, I thank you, Patricia, for the question. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the real challenge, right? I, I see this come up so many times is that a lot of the therapy is directed at, um, and a, a lot of the new trials is directed at understanding how we can affect change in sort of the progression of disease. So a lot of targeting of early or newly diagnosed. I would really encourage you, you know, with with the clinical sites, and if you really would like to get involved in, in, in trials, um, I believe um, Michael J. Fox has has actually a clinical trial finder and uh, where you can kind of put in your information and see what's available near you. Or you can always contact us and we can, can talk about what's available and what you may qualify for. Um, at this time, I don't believe our site necessarily has anything for more advanced Parkinson's no. disease right now, but I would really encourage you to kind of see um, what local sites are there and, and, and track through that. Thank you. And also, I just want to make sure that um, you do uh, come to our support groups because there's a lot of information in the room. A lot of different people are aware of the different studies and can potentially help you. Um, direct you. Can't promise that, but it's definitely a good place for networking and emotional support is very important when you're going through this. And we're here for that. This is uh, Tom, and the question I have has got to do with donating your brain. Does the family ever get any feedback on it, what was found or discovered during autopsy of that brain? Or Yeah, I... So I am not sure exactly on the process. Maddie, do you know, um, as part of PPMI, what the process is? Um, I don't know, unfortunately. But um, if you want to, I put my email in the chat somewhere. And that's something that Emily and I can look into, if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. If, if you want me to speak to my personal experience doing it, it was outside of um, Michael J. Fox. Uh, I can find the site. It was, you know, a legit site that does intake and matches you to an organization that's doing research um, that is close to where you live because there's a very short window after someone passes away for the brain to be received by the entity that's going to do the, the autopsy. Um, so they connect you. Uh, in my case, we were connected to UCLA and I live in Los Angeles. And um, it, I was told there's a, you, you fill out a lot of intake information. And then there's a box to check whether the family would like to see the results. And my family checked, yes, please. And we were told it would take about two years for my family to receive those results. Now, my person with Parkinson's passed away during COVID. It's been just past two years and I checked in with them and they're like, oh, we're running late. I'm sorry. It's probably going to be around summer that you'll hear. So I am still awaiting results, but there is the option to find out. It's supposed to be free. There was a little glitch in that process with me. Uh, so if you're interested, I can walk you through that and I will be happy to pass along to uh, PCLA, you know, how I, how I got into that intake. The other thing that's a little different, um, and I'm not affiliated with any of these things. I'm just trying to do my part for my family and for Parkinson's. The other thing I did was before my persons with Parkinson's passed away, I banked some of his blood because we had done what's called the neuropsych panel and he came up negative on everything. But I know that science advances. And so I banked some of his blood so that when science advances, hopefully we can run tests on his blood to see whether there's some, something there that had not been um, part of the analysis when the neuropsych panel was done. 
And because my personal belief is it's easier to find out that information on the person who is already diagnosed than subject people who are alive and have not yet been diagnosed with that information because that can be traumatic and it's a hard decision. So I banked his blood. So that's, I would encourage people to look into that. If people are already diagnosed with Parkinson's and they want to do something with, for their family, I can pass that information on to PCLA as well. It was a very modest uh, amount of money to bank the blood. It was, I forget, like I want to say $95, $75. And they hold it for 50 years. Oh. So, you know, I don't know what they charge once <laughs> I don't know if they will release it to some other organization free of charge or if they'll have to run the test. There's some other charge, but I look at that as, you know, a nice insur insurance policy. Okay. So I'm happy to pass those two things along, but that's what I did for my family and for further Parkinson's research. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Uh, I have a question for Emily. Stephen. Yes. Hi, Stephen. Um, hi. I was diagnosed in 2006, um, and uh, today it's, get, it's started to get worse in the last six to eight months. Uh, that's the symptoms, that is. I'm having a great time trying to keep my balance and not, not fall too often and so on. But my question is, are you, in your research, are you looking at the, the, the triggers that trigger the symptoms as a, as a, as a sort of po point of information, and typically with stress? Uh, so we are looking more at risk factors. I think we, we know very well that, you know, stress can, can bring out a lot of different symptoms, right? In particular, tremor as well. Um, people can have breakthrough tremor when they're anxious, when they're stressed, overtired. So certainly that's been a, a pretty well-established phenomenon. In this study, we are certainly looking at risk factors. And we are looking also, I think what's key is how things progress over time. Um, it's very hard as a clinician to tell a patient, this is what you're going to look like in five years, uh, 10 years um, down the line. We have some idea, but there's so much variability in, in the different course that people take. So that, that can be challenging. So that's what we're, we are trying to figure that out is, um, how can we better prognosticate and, and plan for the future and know how it progresses? Um, yeah. The biggest challenge is, is planning your aftercare when once it's been diagnosed, and that's really hard because there's no diagnosis that gives you any kind of uh, prognosis. Right, right. And, I mean, we have, you know, we have some general ideas, right? We know that there are certain types of people who, for example, you know, present with with mostly tremor, we call tremor predominant, um, have a, a little bit of a slower course overall, um, but uh, it's still really hard for us to prognosticate. And, and I, I agree with you. I think that's the biggest challenge. And the reason why that's important is, is planning for the future, even setting aside, you know, therapies, which, which we work on to change the course of the disease. It's how, how do we help plan for what's to come? And, and I, I agree with you that, you know, that's part of what we're trying to understand as well. So we'll do one last comment about that. Um, would it be a good idea if, the, you know, people who've got PD to try and build a profile of their own so they can give you a sort of a, 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 a plan that they're taking so you can then compare plans and advise people that, uh, you know, this is a possible plan that might, might do this or that? So a plan for um, for just what symptoms you're feeling or? Well, dealing with the day-to-day -day fact that you've got a very serious disease that you, eventually you're going to die of it. I mean, yeah, I'd so like to spend the rest of my years, you know, being productive and, and positive about the whole thing. And it's really hard to do that because the, the research isn't, isn't, um, it isn't completely clear. It doesn't answer yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah. So I think, you know, one, one reason why, so, I, I, so to answer your question, the more we know and the more people are able to share and track the natural course of what they're experiencing, 
um, the more it helps us. Um, one thing that I think is really important about having this sort of open access data set, it, it's really a library of information, right? And we can go back and we can look at it and we can further subdivide, you know, these people had these sorts of problems and this is what some of these markers look like. Um, that's really key. But the fact that this is an open data set which can be shared, I think really helps us to be more efficient in, in finding these answers. Um, so and so could, that's could, something as a that's patient, really we can have access to that data. So, um, so uh, the access to that data is is really through researchers right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's and that, um, drug companies have so people who are developing solutions also have access to it. Right. Right. So this is really meant to be something that facilitates collaboration and facilitates collaboration through industry, through the pharmaceutical um, companies, biotechnologies, so people working on devices um, as well. Um, it's meant to kind of be that, that sort of resource for them so they can, can better develop and, and um, create therapies. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Chantanandar for joining us um, today. And thank you all for your great questions and attention. Um, some great events coming up. Um, you can join us next week to learn about a new treatment that targets off times in Parkinson's. And next month we will learn about the benefits of the Alexander Technique and about how palliative care can benefit and families living with Parkinson's and palliative care is something you can start planning for early. Um, we will also celebrate the creativity of our community with our second annual Poetry Jam event online. Links to register for these events are, as well as updates for all of our programs will be sent out to our email list. Today's event was made possible by our sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, and Kiowa Kieran. And by you, by donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of the families in our community who are living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's programs, please consider donating at PCLA.org to help us continue to provide programs like this for free. As always, reach out to us with questions at info at pcla.org or by phone at 310-880-3143. Thank you everyone so much.